Okay, we're talking about galvanic corrosion. And in lab, we're going to be doing two uh, small portions in two different weeks relative to this. The first portion is just setting some metals up in a, in a galvanic cell and letting it sit for a number of weeks and then coming back at a later time and then assessing how much mass of material was lost by the various combinations of materials. And so when we're in lab, <clears throat> we give you this nice chart of cathodic and anodic materials and we let you know that basically the anodic is the more likely to corrode. So if we think um, cathodes are more noble, so think living in the towers, having a good life, you're not going to corrode these being more susceptible to corrosion down here. You could think of it that way if you wanted to. The other deal is if I take two pieces of stainless steel and hook them together here, a 304 and a 316, they're really close in that galvanic series here, and there's going to be very low potential, and there's not going to be a lot of galvanic corrosion happening versus if I took the 316 or a 304 stainless and put it with uh, aluminum alloys, I'm going to see the aluminum alloys corroding fairly fast because there's a large distance in potential here. Now, looking over here, we have copper and we have iron. If I look at copper and iron, here's my copper nickel alloys. Here's copper right here. And we look at iron. Where's iron going to be at? Right here, we have steel. So we're going to see the steel tend to corrode because it's more anodic. And if we look at this chart, yes, we're going to have some corrosion going on. So in theory class, you're going to talk about galvanic corrosion. You're going to see a lot of this. And it relates a lot to your chemistry with the hydroxides being given off here. If we look at a different combination of metals like zinc and iron. So here's iron again. And we look at zinc. Now zinc is more anodic. And we're going to see the zinc tending to corrode versus and lose mass versus the iron. So when you're in lab, you're going to make different galvanic cells of different metals. So you might want to get some that are farther out relative to each other so you can see some mass of material lost in the next few weeks as that cell sits. Now what is a galvanic cell? Basically we're taking a beaker and we're creating a solution with a lot of free ions in there by putting salt. So we're having salt water in there. And we're going to take one material that's going to become our cathode and the other one is going to be our anode. Now we're not putting a battery in there, but we're creating a bridge for transfers of electrons. And you notice we do that with a little piece of metal and in between the two and we bind them with the clips. So we have transfer of electrons going on. And that's how we generate our galvanic cell. Now, ways we can prevent a galvanic cell from happening is if we have two different materials, copper and stainless, and, and our anode here is being copper, if we have an electrolyte, that can set up a galvanic cell here. So what we could do is put an insulator. Maybe we put a piece of rubber or something between the two, and that can disconnect the electrical connection there. Other things we can do is get materials like copper and bronze that are very close to each other in the galvanic cell, and we're probably not going to have a big potential and a lot of corrosion happening there. Or the other thing we can do is just keep the moisture or the liquids from making contact and making that bridge from one metal to the other. Uh, the last one we have here is maybe coming in a protective coating on one of the materials so that the electrons hit that and can't transfer into this cathode or out of. So we're restricting flow of current one way or the other. If we look at some examples of galvanic corrosion um, in plumbing, a lot of times you see people with galvanic or galvanized pipe hooking up to copper. And yes, we're going to see a lot of corrosion happening here at this point. Another good point is maybe an aluminum mass on a sailboat where we put a stainless steel piece of hardware on here and this has been removed and the salt water gets in there and sets up a galvanic cell in between there. Uh, if we're doing electrical work or plumbing work, sometimes we'll have different um, unions that we can take. Maybe that has one type of metal versus another metal with a plastic interface separating that material from generating the uh, galvanic cell that we talked about. Another place we see uh, galvanic cells set up or something like a boat engine where we have aluminum or manganese, magnesium housings and those are going to tend to corrode pretty good quick. So what we'll do is put a sacrificial anode. Okay, What we're going to do is come in here and put some zinc on strategic places on the motor. So if you look at the back of a motor and you see a little piece that looks like this, which is this right here, it's a little trim tab. Those are actually going to deteriorate over time and may need to be replaced because what we can do is make that a zinc 
anode and it will deteriorate. That's going to save the rest of the engine from corroding, especially this lower end unit. So we're going to see expendable anodes in the form of zinc on those kind of applications. So if you're dealing with a boat, you might want to check your anodes out. Likewise, in your hot water heater in your house, we put a sacrificial anode. And inside there, there may be a bung here with a, a nut that's hex like this. And inside is a long rod that is a sacrificial rod. Here's a new one. Here's one that's been used after a while. So after a period of time, those rods are going to tend to deteriorate and you may want to replace that rod. Typically, when you see that deteriorate, you're probably going to see the tank start to corrode and form pit corrosion fairly quick. Not many people really ever change their anodes. Now, if you're an RV, I recommend doing that annually when you drain your tank. Just throw a new anode in there because they're a lot shorter than the big anodes. Matter of fact, in a lot of the new water heaters, we're seeing the anode being connected to the bung of the hot water supply over here. And what that does is keep from having to install another bung just for an anode. So somebody saved money, but with the PEX pipe and the new plumbing systems, now you're going to have to have a plumber come in, disconnect all this, pull this anode out, uh, and that's going to take a lot more uh, cost. And so what's the cost of having a plumber come in and change the anode versus just changing out the water heater? We can see galvanic cells set up just on a piece of steel. If we see rust on a part like this, what's happened is we've had moisture form on the surface of the iron or the steel, and that moisture will actually generate a localized um, deposit here. It'll generate that galvanic cell having a cathode and anode effect, and we're going to see that happening. And so a lot of times you see corrosion on steel that sets up, even though it's just all one metal, it can generate its own um, galvanic cell through these rust deposits. Now if we look at things like the size of the anode versus the cathodes, we're going to see the size of the part here affecting how fast one deteriorates. So if we have a larger cathode, we're going to see that anode, if that bolt there was an anode, deteriorate faster versus a smaller cathode over here. Uh, we can also have different pHs, so if we have a material that goes into a solution that has different pH values, we might see an anode cathodic reaction happening there. Now, we use this galvanic series to our advantage at times to keep things from corroding. So if we have a bucket like this that's galvanized, hot dip galvanized bucket, we may have this blue portion represents steel and we put a, a zinc coating on top. And what's going to happen is even if you scratch that, it's going to still want to deteriorate this zinc coating and it's not going to let you corrode that material coming down. If we just painted a surface and it got scratched, it would rust and corrode up underneath there and set up a nice cell and corrode away. So galvanizing a piece of steel is a great way to keep the material from corroding, even if it gets scratched in an area where that coating comes off. One last thing I wanted to talk about is some cool things that we do. We can actually, on pipelines or in ships, we know we have a current, so why not put an imposed current that resists that current flow? You know, we talked about ways to stop a galvanic cell from happening. What if we can measure that flow and put an opposite flow of current in and stop that? So ships may have ex uh, expendable anodes on the outside, but they also can put a imposed current and it's a very small amount of current to help keep the main hole from corroding. So anyway, you're going to have fun doing the lab. You're going to be looking at those samples that you put in a galvanic cell and establishing and confirming the galvanic series and seeing how those materials form anodes and cathodes in different configurations.